you go. So uh, last Friday, we talked about a lot of concepts related to, uh, I guess, maintaining the data, maintaining the record, uh, mutability versus immutability. And some of you are already running into this, uh, I guess, immutability problem in, uh, in some of the in-class exercise you are implementing. Uh, and I know it's a unique concept, uh, but as I said, this sometimes uh, when you have the will declare mutability or immutability, you can actually uh, prove your code and 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 make sure the code is really safe. And today, toward the end of this class, we will talk about how to make things mutable. So. Before we uh, begin, even begin, uh, here is the in-class exercise that I want you to do today. Uh, toward the end of this class, this is for the later part of the last lecture. Uh, I did not load too much in-class exercise into the last lecture, and I'm not sure if I should be glad or not. There's only like three of you in the in-class exercise period, and I think we need to fix it. When I finish the lecture and move on to the exercise, it doesn't mean that the lecture ends. It basically means that, hey, uh, we are done with me monologuing your session. It's my time to basically look at what you're coding and so that we can go through your code together. Doesn't mean the class is over. Uh, so please do take advantage of that. It is the time where I can go to each one of you and, and basically troubleshoot everything you're running into. Um, I would basically, during this period, I'll get back to you as soon as possible, basically while I'm here in the lecture hours, this is a four hour slot, right? So, so that's that, please, please, please do. Whenever the lecture is over, don't just go have lunch and never come back. <laughs> because we have almost 30 people here, only three show up. Uh, and I know that this semester is a little bit odd because of the online format. Next semester, I think it should be offline now, now that kind of everything is open, uh, depending on the policy. So, so please bear with us for one more semester. I'm, I'm sorry for, for the formatting. I know it's not perfect for learning. But here's the in-class exercise six that I would like you to do. Most of this has to do with either the mutability versus immutability concepts and how to make something that close to an object, right? So let's talk about an object and let's actually uh, create more things. Now I'm gonna start to talk about what is, what is closer to what you've known in Java, right? Object-oriented programming and, and let's relearn OOP, but in a way that ties to the language. How does the language treat OOP and how would you uh, reason about it? And we do this by example. Let's create a rational number. What is the rational number? Can someone tell me what's a rational number? Yes, it can be written in the form of A equals P over Q. Basically, you divide two numbers together. That's a rational number. And how you can implement it, the, the, the simplest form that you can do is you can use a pair, right? You can say type rational equals int, uh, not pointer, I need a pen here, right? And say it's an int and int. And then the add function, right? If you want to add two rational numbers together, uh, you have P and you have Q, right? So what you can do is do pattern matching, P and Q, right? Uh, in the case that you have the input, which is the, uh, uh, the first case, first pair, second pair, right? Numerator, denominator. So N and D come from numerator and denominator. And what you do is on the top part is NP multiplied by DQ, numerator of P, denominator of Q, numerator of Q, denominator of P. I'm sorry about my tongue twisting. I have always had the challenge whenever I need to pronounce those two words. 
and then the the one below right when you divide the uh, dp multiply by dq you multiply the denominator of the two numbers together and you can actually write a two string right by having p dot two string over q dot two string it's as simple as that right so that's the first idea use a pair and you can do pattern matching to do an add. You can do pattern matching to do a multiply, right? Using the same concepts. Another way you can do it because we learned about record last week, right? And we we actually mentioned in class, like some some of you are actually saying, "Hey, this is like OOP." And yes, it is like OOP. So you can create a class called rational number, right? This is an OOP concept uh, in a programming language way, basically. This means that we are declaring, right, declaring this new class, right? That's called rational number. Whenever I create a rational number, I need to initialize two things, n and d. n and d are numerator, denominator. And then you inside there, inside the class, you can say def p and def to string while uh you have the add function basically you create right equals mean that you are returning you're returning a new rational number that perform the multiply of the numerator and denominator together and then divide by the other uh, uh, uh the the multiplication of denominators my question is why do i have to return a new rational number why do I have to return a new rational number when I do an add? Oh wow, my handwriting is so bad. So why new rational number? It's not called invariant, it's called immutability. Because we can't modify the content, right? So we return a new object. It's an object called, it's, it is an object type rational number that has this addition, basically whatever is here is a pair. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a class rational number that represents a new results of P and Q add together. Same thing here, you have the equal sign, right? over here my question here is this is more like a functional language concept but why in here we don't have to say string in in parentheses whatever the reason behind that is uh implicitly when you add string together that by default it returns a new string object Basically, you already got a new string. That's why you don't have to say hey, string, blah, 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 inside. This is okay. Any questions so far? Basically, you can do the record that we learned for this particular task. All right, then let me proceed to use a different method. One thing I can do is, uh, instead of using a record, let's full-blown use a class, right? We want to create a class that define a rational number. So remember the earlier example, I said case class, right? To create a record. Then you def add, def to string. This add and to string are not, they are not a part of our class. So to actually do what object-oriented programming are offering you, you can do this using an actual class. So you say class rational. This part is similar, right? This part, this part is similar to our earlier example. The difference here is, well, you actually define, uh, you have N and D, right? Now N and D goes into this class and you, create this internal variable called numerator and denominator, these numer and denom are a part of your class. You take n, you take d, n is assigned to numer, d is assigned to denom, right? 
there's a thing called new in Scala. When you said new uh, rational, it means that I'm going to create a new rational object, right? So if I want to, so if I want to instantiate, right? Uh, three over four, what do I type in? So let's say I want to do val uh, a equal this. So what comes after this equal sign? How do I create this object? New rational T4, yes. So this is what you do. And to access R, remember our tuple? So to access R, because this is an object, you can just do dot, dot numer and dot denom. Oops. Uh, basically here, uh, if you say, if you say r dot numer, what are you getting? Are you getting a three or four or something? What what do you? Three. Yes. And this would give you four. Any questions about why these give you three and four? Basically, three goes in here, right? And this go into here, this go into numer. Four goes from here to this part, right? This go into this variable G, and that go to genome. Yeah, so so you can do just R dot numer, that's fine. The reason behind that is numer doesn't take an input. If numer is a function that takes an input, r.numer uh, will give you a function. We're going to learn about this in a little bit. This is function as a first class citizen. You can do r.numer even though numer is a function. It's going to be a little bit more uh, thought provoking but, and fun, but uh, it's not too bad. All right, so let's implement an app. This is simple, right? So you can say, hey, I want to def add, right? Basically define an add function. Return a new object, new rational number. So what if r, what if var, oh, what if is var instead of def over here? You mean over here? Okay, so if you add, sorry, pen drop. Uh, what if you use val, right, instead of def? Uh, over here, because it's a function declaration, it's, uh, def would pair the value of n whenever you call, right? Whenever you call this rational number. If you use val, if you use val, it doesn't really mean, like, have a legit meaning because you're trying to call it without actually taking it. So if you use val, you're going to get a function, right? That try to take the value n, but you haven't initialized it. So that's why we use def. Def just pair the name. Right? The name numer is now linked to n. And whenever you call the rational number, n would, the input to n comes in here, and n goes into numer. And that's a, so to actually, so let me make sure that Scala, so my, 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 my answer is I'm not 100% sure. Let me try to do val and see if Scala yell back at me or it actually do something weird with it. Okay, so with, with that, please keep this question in mind. I'll go back and, and address it whenever I try it out. I feel like they're gonna do uh, they're gonna the, the compiler might say hey this is not legal but let me double check all right the reason why we use def is basically we want to pair you map map the name numer to n whenever n actually get called right whenever we have the value for for n when we initialize rational number n the value comes in and it binds to numer val try to bind it right away so i'm not sure how this would be treated that's why i'm not sure 
let me double check on that and I'll get back to you. All right. Okay, so to add the two numbers together, uh, what does this come from? Which one is this? But this in here? That's not this. You mean in these slides? So this, this refer to our object. Remember in Java, right? When you use the keyword this, it refers to the current object. So let's say you do val or equal rational three four right, and I say r dot add. Whenever I say r dot add, and then I said q, I'm gonna add it to another rational number. In this case, q is that. Right, it's the input right here, or over here is this. It's this object. This is the keyword similar to how Java, uh, I'm not sorry, how Java treat its own object. Okay, so the way you can run this add function is rational number dot add inside parentheses is another rational number. In this case, this is our own object. That is your input. Does it clear up your question? And it's okay to say no. Uh, and we will go through that answer. Nope. Okay. Uh, so in this two case, in this case, uh, we want to add two things together. You add one number. Let, let me let me erase my notes here. Okay, so you have R1 and R2, both are rational. Right, so both are rational numbers. So you with me so far. Basically, you, you, we want to add R1 and R2. Basically, this is what we want to do, R1 plus R2. Then, if we define this function inside, this is defined inside, the class rational, right? Basically, we define it right here, right? Inside this, let me use a different color, green. Basically, define app as described in the next slide, right? After we do def denom, we would be the next line we say def at def at. That is an input, right? That is an input. We take this function takes in one rational number. It return a new rational number. And the new rational number is the addition of our rational number and this input. So if we call if we call r one dot app r two r one dot add r two. Which one out of this r one and r two? Which one go into the that name in here? R two yes. R2 is an input to my add function. What is the name for the input that uh, goes into my add? That. R1 is, R1 is an object, is a class called rational, right? Inside this object, it has numerator and denominator already. So you can say this. This means that I'm referring to myself. I just want to add myself with R2. So R1 in here goes into this. Does it clear up the confusion? Okay, perfect. So this is 
going into that. And because we do something dot, right, it's going to this. Basically, we are calling the add function, which is a part of R1. This is a part of R1. So when you say this, the compiler will know, okay, it's, it's, it's something belongs to R1. And you can do multiply using the same method, right? You can say uh, multiply that rational dot new, I mean, equals new, uh, return the multiplication of the numerator and that uh, the other denominator, denominator, sorry. And over here, you notice we can just say numer and denom without this and that. That's also okay. So you can do two ways. You can do this dot. This dot refer to itself. If you don't refer to, if you don't use this dot and use numer, that's also okay because this multiply is declare inside the rational function, so not a rational class. So it still will pick the R1's numerator and R1's denominator. Okay, so one more thing. Uh, you can override function by typing in override. Override means that I know that someone already implemented the two string function for me, but I don't like that version of two string. So I'm gonna define my own version of two string. You say you can say overwrite def two string. Basically, now we bind the new way, new way to define two string by uh, uh, this definition, right? Numer whatever number it is. So if it's uh, uh, basically it can be three divide by four, right? If we have a rational number to represent three over four. Any questions so far? All right, so we can just add this into a string like Python. Oh, okay, that's a great question. The, the operation add over here, So this work, this actually work. Uh, I think it should work in a similar way as Python. It can treat numer as a string and it return a string. Any other questions? Yeah, basically in functional programming, everything depends on how you define an operator, right? You, you Ajahn, how do you write the green color like beside three or four? Uh huh? What did you just write like uh, the arrow? Oh, 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 oh. Work, work. <laughs> Sorry, let me give it. Let me rewrite this. Sorry about my poor handwriting. Basically, it is, this is also the way you can tell, hey, I have the add operator, and this is how it would work. You can overwrite the plus sign so that it works with a pair, for example, or, or it would work with uh, a list. How can you add two lists together? Over here, uh, you basically, it means that someone implicitly already overwrite the case where you have a string and it, or an int and string, and this is how it would return. Okay, okay. and if you talk about object-oriented programming, uh, one thing that is discussed all the time is public versus private, right? So everything we define so far is public. You can access it, everyone can access it. What is a private function? Can someone tell me what's the purpose of a private function? Not everyone can overview it, can view it except the owner. Yes, except the owner. No one else can access it. Well, what, uh, what we call this is uh, sometimes in the general term is called access control. I don't want people to see into my private function or the public function, I don't care. So over here, uh, if you want a private function, you can type in private. That's it. It's as simple as that in Scala. Uh, in Scala, 
you just say private and then the rest are the same. It means that inside, right, inside a rational number or inside whatever, whatever owns this function or definition can use it, no one else can. By default, everything is public, as I said. Any questions about this? Basically, if you want something private, just say private. That's all. That's all. That's the purpose of this uh, slide. You can also use a constructor. What is a constructor in object-oriented programming? Let me redefine what constructor means. To construct means to build, right? Yes, it's to build a class. So basically the constructor, when you add third to a word, it means that it's someone that do that task, right? So in, in, a, in a programming language, whenever you see the term constructor, it means that it's a, fun. It's, a it's a unit, it's a something, it's a, it's a unit of thing that build your object. So we can define a constructor by adding the, let me be more clear, here, by basically, you can say def this, right? def this. Exactly, basically a constructor, whenever I create a class, the constructor described how do I build it. This is general in any language. Whenever you see term constructor, it's the procedure, as you said, it's a procedure that get run. The procedure describes how you instantiate, how you initialize the class, right? Over here, this is a self-reference, right? And this means that I text in uh, and right, I take in just one number. So if we have a rational number, right? Usually we would take in two number. Usually we would take in two number. A constructor over here, what we just do is we just say, okay, now rational number would work with one input too. And this is how it works. If I say rational four, rational, not T, sorry, my handwriting again. Rational four, what are you getting? This is a two input straight version. This is a one input version. And now we just declare that, okay, when we will have a, met, uh, a constructed work with one input as well. So this four, number four goes in here as N, right? Then how you treat it as uh, this is similar to calling rational or one, right? So you can use this as self-reference to itself. Basically you say, hey, rational for one. It's a calling rational for one. You can say this for one. And here are more example, right? Uh, you can say, uh, let me draw a line here. This is not specific to a constructor. This is an example of using class. Sorry, this should be a new slide. My bad, I should have made a new slide out of this. Basically, this is this go into the new slide. This is how we can actually deal with a class. So you can declare a, a rational, a function called less that takes in a rational number and compare two rational number together. If this is less than that, it would return true, right? You check numer multiply by that dot mean denominator. If less than that dot numerator multiply by this, denominator. And note, as I said, you can just type in numer right here, 
right? Or you can do this not number, it's the same thing. It's going to point to the same variable. I was about to say object, but that's a variable. Any questions so far? All right, then let's talk about overloading. How many of you overloaded over there before? In Java, so the same concepts. We can overload over there here. So it's a, as I said, we are learning how we can build a programming language, right? The keyword overloading is basically it appears everywhere in our language, and this is actually how it works. So let's say you want to add rational number one and two together, and I just type in R one plus R two. What will happen in Scala? What's the common thing that happened to all of you whenever you whenever find they will ask for the def define of it? Yes. They was like, I don't know how to add these two numbers together. My add take in, for example, I want input as an integer. Now you're giving me rational and I don't know how to deal with it. Right? So we can overload it. Unlike an integer, the way you add two rational numbers is different, right? So you can you can just say I want to do x plus y. You are going to have to define r dot add as what uh, basically similar to how we do it earlier. Alternatively, you can overload the plus right the plus operator. This is the plus operator because these are function. Literally, operator is our function. It has the left input and the right input. They do something with those inputs, right? We can then redefine it. The way you do this is the plus. This is our function name. We are overloading. This thing would be here. Oops. Do uh, one plus uh, two without overloading the plus sign. Over here, you just define similar to the add function. So this means that we can overload the plus minus. What's the difference between this minus and unary negative? Whenever you have the keyword unary, the unary followed by an operator, it means that it's a, it takes one input, something like negative r, not a bar. These are unary operator. The rest are binary, it takes two input. And keep in mind that the precedence rule stays the same. What are precedence? Okay, that's a great question. So basically, what's the advantage of overloading versus having our own like dot add function? Uh, depends on usability. So uh, actually, my opinion about it. So this this range from uh, uh, how we treat the way we program. So this is more discussion than than you might have realized. Overloading gives the programmer an option right, to be a little bit more lazy, but you also have to be a little bit more careful. If you overload an operator, one of the problems you run into is that there's a precedence rule. What is a precedence rule? Multiply has to be done before, right, 
add or subtract this a precedent rule. So if you overload the multiply, you then have to realize that that multiply would happen before the add. So if you overload both multiply and add a negative sign, you need to make sure what happened first, what happens next. The advantage overloading is essentially when you program, if it's an object that's super obvious, things like rational number, things like a real number, things like an imaginary number, like with the I, then you can overload it. The way it adds, the way it multiplies, the way it do a subtract, it's the same. So instead of typing the word dot add, you save, I guess, three keystroke. So does it answer your question? Basically, it's, it's for the convenience uh, to program angle. Okay, basically it is for convenience. Uh, what we call in general this convenience to program or how easy it is to program, in computer science we call this term programmability, the ability to program. So if you compare Python versus C versus assembly, Python is more programmable. Uh, I mean, not more programmable in, in a sense that uh, in a hardware sense, but it's easier to program. It has higher programmability than assembly, right? You probably don't want to program in assembly all the time, right? And overloading is a concept in programming language to improve programmability. It gives the programmer ability to declare its own operator overwrites its own way, a bit of how you would treat the operator. In object-oriented programming, you have to abstract class, right? So what if you want to make an abstract class in functional language? What is an abstract class? All right, let, let me review, review uh, OOP for you guys. What is an abstract class? Yes, it's a parameter that are not fully bind, fully declare. It's declare, but it's not declare in a sense that you have implement the function. You declare the parameters. This class will take in numerator and denominator, and that's all I know. I'm going to implement this later. So let's say we want to do the following. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we, we declare the function in kind of like function interface and we implement those later on, right? So let's say we want a set, we want to implement a set of integer, right? And it has two function, add, which means that I add a new item to my set, has would check if X is a member of my set, right? Simple, two function. How can we specify the interface? You can use abstract class for that particular uh, 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 goal, right? Let's create an abstract class by typing in the keyword abstract in Scala. This would create an abstract class. So what are the information that you have? So what are the information do we get from this declaration? So we know that there's a class called inset. Right, there's a class called inset. Inside the class, there are two functions, add and half. Add takes in integer, returns inset. Half takes in integer, 
return boolean. We declare the name of the function that goes into the class. Uh, you can make it recursive, you can make it non-recursive. Either way works, basically these give the information that, hey, I have an add function. I don't know what it does, but it would take an integer. And whenever this function finish, it returns an inset. For the other function has, it takes an integer, it returns a boolean. And that's all. We then implement the class later. Whenever we know what to do with the class, we implement it later. And here's how you can implement it. Basically, uh, let's use and the linked list because we just we learn how to modify a linked list. So let's use a linked list to maintain our set, right? The way you implement a set, you can do it using different data structure. Uh, in here, let's use a linked list. So over here, we can say class empty that extend in set. Right? The keyword extend. The keyword extend tell the compiler that this class empty, this class empty has the definition of an inset. So what's the definition of inset? They have two functions, has and add. Has and add. Has takes in an integer, return a boolean. If your set is empty, what do you return? You return false, right? Nothing is in my set. So whatever number you're trying to search is false. If you want to add a new item to my empty set, empty set, this is not a complete implementation of my inset, but if my set is empty, it means that I'm going to create a new object called, let's, let's name it non-empty. This can be any name you want, but you would implement the non-empty class later. You return new non-empty. That consists of x and empty. And consists of x and empty. We'll explain why do we have to put things in here in a bit. And here's the explanation. You declare a non-empty as a class. Also again, extend, right? extend the inset. So it extend the inset. It basically tells that, hey, this non-empty class would have the same property as an inset as well. It's a set of integer, but for the non-empty set. It takes in two inputs. It takes in two inputs, right? Adder and ELT. ELT over here, I use the word ELT to sample elements. It's an integer. Adder is an inset. Over here, new empty. New empty, what's the type of new empty? Whenever I create this object called empty, what's their type? What's the type of empty that we declare right here? Inset, yes. So this is has a if this has a type of inset. What about X? What's the type of X over here? So to tell the type of X, I go to the function declaration, which is an int, right? Int. So X would go into this input, the empty, which is an inset over here, goes to here, right? And now we're gonna implement this recursively. If if we have basically we have two functions, has it has and add. Has is easier to 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 do. So we'll do that first. Non-empty, as I said, we will implement it as a list, right? That that list consists of the current item and the rest of my set current item and the rest of my set. 
ELT is my current item. Other is the rest of my set. Right? If X is equal ELT, we have our element, so we can return true. If X is ELT, we will definitely return true. If X is not the same as ELT, we say, okay, look at this other set and check if they have X. This is done recursively. Any questions so far about the has function? So over here, let me let me draw this. So this is the has, right? We have non-empty. And let's say you have x, y, c in your set. So x is here, y, and c. This is out. These are in adder. Right? So you check for x. If x is in out, yay, this is true. Otherwise, check if x is in adder. Check if x is in adder. My question then is when will has terminate? If doesn't if if I want listen, if I say has m, which is not in my set, right? Which is not in my set, it will first check if m is x false, right? So you check adder has m. Adder has m, what's my adder? My adder has y and c. Y and c. Right? That is also an inset. So you will check if m equals to y, that's false. Check if other has m. In this case, other is c and empty. Right? C and empty. So you will check if c equals else, other has m. Then my other is empty. What does has return when it's an empty set? return false, right? So if nothing, if the content that I want to search is not in my set, you are going through this list and eventually it would go into the empty and it will return false. Any questions about the has function? Okay, so uh, what when are we removing x and y from other? Oh, 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 okay. So it's already declared in a non-empty input. Basically, in non-empty, it takes in it takes in two things: current element and other, right? And it when we build when we build our set when we build our set, you gonna add 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 add. Add things together. What is so? This is basically what we're going next because we will then have to implement our add function. Right? Our add function. Initially, our set is empty, right? So what happened when you add x into empty? What happened when you add x into empty? What is this? Add. So we start with empty. And then we add x. If we add x, you are here. So you are going to return non empty of x and empty. Right? Are you with me so far? Basically, when you add something to our empty set, you get non-empty starting with x and empty. Then let's say we add, and let's call this, I guess, uh, a, I, I just run out of name. Basically, let's, let's call this a, a. We do a, a dot add y. If we do a, a dot add y, we are right here, right? 
what is my input? Yes, so if uh, to, to address this question, when we start with an empty object and we call an add to this, it becomes non-empty based on how we define it here. We are programming it right now. Basically, we start with an empty object, we add one thing to that. We will, the, the clean way to do this is we are going to define the non-empty version and define how we deal with it. So over here, when we do add, right, this would become, y right and then you have x and empty in there are you all with me so far then you can do again dot add c right this would give you c and then y and then x and then empty Right, because it's the definition right here. You return, you return new, new non-empty set, new non-empty set that consists of the thing you want to add, and this, this is our current object. Right. So, any questions about this part? Awesome. Uh, if you have still have question, uh, feel free to let me know uh, through the chat. I'm going to check it out. All right. And as you can see here, both empty and non-empty extend inset, right? Which means that boards are conforming to our declaration of inset, right? Which means that we can tell that inset is a super class to empty and non-empty. And empty and non-empty are vice versa. It's a subclass of inset. This is object-oriented programming revisited. And everything, everything has this object as a superclass in Scala, right? This also includes your REPL statement, right? So everything is under this object. Okay, okay. All right, so I'm gonna return back for a minute. Say, yeah, yeah, what's your question? Or should I just stay here for a bit for you to process it oh you're taking notes so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh basically i'm also going to uh uh put this file with annotation on the canvas if i forget to put the annotation version on canvas please 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 do let me know So basically, uh, this is like object-oriented programming 101 again, right? Both empty and non-empty extend inset, and they conform to inset. Inset becomes a superclass to empty and non-empty, and everything has object as a superclass. It's the universe in some sense, right? For every class inside Scala. And one thing you might have realized with this empty in particular, right? It's there's only one empty, right? There's only one version of empty. While the non-empty, you can have the one with size of one, size of two, size of three. But the empty inset is going to be unique, right? So why having multiple copies, you can limit it to one, right? Over here, empty set should really have one copy. In other language, we call this a static. What is a static class in Java? It's a singleton, right? We some uh someone already mentioned this, I think, two lectures ago about the singleton object. We can use the word object to create this singleton thing. Instead of say class empty extend inset, you say object empty extend inset. These define an object called empty and no instance of empty can be created. Basically, now you have this object called empty, 
which is a singleton, you can't make the second cop copy of empty is now defined as a single thing. And then it evaluate to itself because object is a value. Uh, because object is a value. All right. So the key takeaway from this slide is instead of creating multiple version of empty, because empty is unique, you can say object empty and you extend it uh, from inset and define what does has return and what does add to. Oh, okay. So cast cast object is for record. Basically, cast object it extend a a trait. It extend a trait over here. It extend a class. Yeah. All right. In class exercise time, so we are going to now implement. Uh, implement basically an expression type to follow the following traits. Basically, you have the trait expression. And I think I forgot to put in a starter code on Canva, so I'm going to put it in right after we finish the lecture. Uh, basically, this exercise implement the following method. It takes in a variable name and return a variable name. It can return a constant negation sum and product. And use, use the concept we just learned to deal with object oriented programming to implement this. And we will take a break now because it's been about an hour. And we're going to switch over to the next topic, which is how we can treat function as a first class citizen. All right, so we'll take a 10 minutes break. We'll meet at 11.15. Is that okay? Okay, so we have one more question. If we create an empty object, when we call add, does it become non-empty? Yes, based on our definition. So if you look at our definition here, uh, here, here. So if we create an empty object right here, what add return, right? What add return is non-empty. But hopefully that answers your question. Basically, we declare how empty works by telling if we add something to this empty object, you are returning an, a non-empty. Okay, so Let's uh let's take a break. Fifteen minutes. Go get coffee. Go get uh, water. Uh, we'll be back in ten minutes. All right. Okay. I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to be back at 11.15. I'm going to go get coffee myself to go. So we'll see you all in uh, 10 minutes, all right?
Okay, so uh, you all back. All right, so let's continue on. Uh, thanks to my cat who walked on the keyboard. I hope everything is okay. Can you hear me? Awesome. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I noticed that she moved back one slide, so I'm not sure what other key stroke that she typed in. Uh, let's continue on talking about the, how we treat uh, function as a first class citizen. And, and basically to recap what we talked about in the first lecture, right? It's a long time ago. Uh, is that function eventually becomes a value, right? So conceptually, conceptually, because functions are value, it means that you can pass function in and return a function because at the end of the day, a return, when you return something, you return a value, which means that if function are value, eventually you can return that value. Right. Uh, for example, if I want to create a function that repeats certain function n times, for example, if I say I want to create a function that repeats Fibonacci n times for whatever reason, I can do this, right? Let's go this through this example one by one. What is bracket a here? We covered it when we talk about the uh, polymorphic types. What this bracket A tells you. So what does bracket A tells you? This is from the, I think from the polymorphic types. That's the lecture, the last lecture. It tells that uh, n times deal with type, the polymorphic type called A, right? And what are the inputs? What are the inputs into my function called n times? What's the input to my function? How many inputs? So let me rephrase. How many inputs into my function? Three. Yes. Okay. Uh, I think. Give me one minute. I need to do my cat who's like behind the monitor right here. I'm trying to play with things. Sorry, this video is currently I'm not asking you, Alexa. Uh, Okay, there are three inputs into my n times function. What is the type of the second and the third input? So those are the easier ones. What's the type of the second and the third input? Integer and a. 
the first input is a function. Right? This thing, this is a function. The second input is integer. And the last input is a. Basically, over here, you want to call f of, oops. You want to call f of x n times. Basically, what you want to do here is you want to call f of x n times. A is not a function, A is a type. Basically, A is a type, and you return type A. F colon, basically, let's break down this uh, decoration. What does colon do? Colon declares a type, right? Colon declares a type. These basically mean that it's a type that is a function. It, this function takes input A and it returns A. So over here, F is a function that takes A and then return A. It takes in A, it return A. What does this function f do? We don't care. Basically, we want to run f of x n times, right? x is type A. We don't care whatever f is doing, but we care that we run this n times. All right, now my chat skip to the last slide. Okay, this is too disruptive, so let me put it down uh, on the floor. Uh, so that she stopped walking on my table. So this function f, I don't care what it does. I only want to repeat it n times. What is actually happening here is if n is zero, which means we finish running it n times, you return x. You return x. Otherwise, you call recursively, right? Calling n times and apply function f right here, apply f, f, right, into the n times of x of n minus 1 and x. So this is basically, if you unwrap this whole thing, if you unwrap this, let's say n is 1, let's say n is 1, n is 1, you're going to run f of x, if n is 1. If n is 2, you would first then run f of x, and then you apply f of f of x if n is 2. If n is 10, then you're going to run f of f of f of f of blah, 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 of x, right? So basically, this apply the function f n times on x. Any questions so far? And the result accumulate over. Basically, the first time you run, the output becomes the input into the next time we run the function. Any questions so far? So this is how you can use function as my input, right? You say f is a function. It takes a, and then it returns a. So let's do more example. Let's do more example. Let's say we define triple as three times x, right? Triple is e three times x. And then we what's the difference between this and general recursion? The difference is we now have a function as an input. It's the same con uh, it's not the same concept. Now, what we're trying to tell you here is basically function can be treated as your input or a return type. How many of you use function pointer in C before? This is similar to how you treat function pointer in C. Yeah, it's been a while, <laughs> I know, for some of you. Uh, in function pointer, you use 
function calls. Put it as an input. That's okay. You can actually return a function. Same concept here. We take function as a value because it's a value. Then it can go into your input. It can go into your output. And so then what, for what is it's the tail function? Huh? Sorry. Actually, I'm still confused with the previous and previous yeah. class. Yeah. No, no, like the last slide. What is that? X dot tail function. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. X dot tail is if X S is a list, right? If X S is a list, X S dot tail would get rid of the head. The, the one item in the front of my list and give you the list that's contain the rest of my items. So get let me be a little bit more concrete. Let's say this is my list. Four, three, one, seven. This is my list. Uh, if you do, so this is XS. XS dot tail would give you three, one and seven and you got rid of four four is x s dot basically they just remove the head of it yes right yes yes okay yes thank you ha. Uh, so basically let's define it this three functions add two just add two uh so what does these do so what do i get from the first function n times triple seven and eleven. This is n, this is x. In case you forgot. What's the result of the first function call? n times triple seven and eleven. Yes. So you start with 11, right? You multiply by three because this is, this is the first time you do this. The result, the result then would get multiply by what? Three. Three. Seven. And what is seven for Hajan? Oh, seven is we're going to repeat this seven times. So we multiply by three again, again, that'll be seven times we apply multiply by three triple seven times so this is the same as 11 multiplied by three to the seven how about the second part add two four and nine nine add two for the four time Yes, so yeah. you have nine and then plus two plus two plus two plus two. Yep. And the third and the fourth one. How about the third and the fourth one? Which one are you getting rid of? You get rid of three. Three would go out. And five would go out. Five would go out. Five would go out. Five would go out. Five twice. Twice. Oh. So you're gonna so get gonna uh, two, only four, two, two, four, four, nine, and seven as the answer. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So this right. is how we can treat function as an input, right? So this is how we can treat function as an input. Notice n times the first input is a function. Triple add two and do tail. Uh, if you want to treat function as an output. Right. If you want to treat function as an output, then remember before we finish the curly bracket, this is our return. So what does we what do we return here? What do we return here? It's a function, right? Yes, it's, uh, sorry, there was a question about the last one here is return the same. Yes, it's the same output, but now it's more 
uh, strongly typed in the sense that they, they declare that, hey, we, we are doing a tail and the list is a list of int. So it should be the same. Okay, so this return an output of my function, right? So we can actually use a shorthand form uh, for defining a function. This is a shorthand form. Whenever you see this arrow sign, whenever you see the arrow sign, you look at the one to the left and one to the right, which is this part and this part. So let me break it down over here, right? So this is x colon int three multiplied by x. This is called a short form when you want to declare a function. What does this function do? It takes, yes, it's exactly as you suggest. This take x as an input and you return three multiplied by x, which is the same thing as declaring this fx equal three x. So this is a short form, arrow signs, produce an output. The whatever declared to the left of my arrow sign, they are the inputs. Any question? So you can return the short form over here, right? N times is a function that takes in an input, return to multiply by x. You multiply it n times, starting with x. So that's a uh, in Scala, the way it treats method and function, it's a little bit different. When we write, when we write def, uh, yes, this is more mathy scheme. The functional programming, everything is based on the function, and function are basically math function. So it's, it's, it, it revolves around mathematics, right? Revolve around how you define math function. Uh, the way we write uh, def, Increment, for example, increment basically just add one to the function. This is not really a function. Def with the parameter, def with the parameter is a method. And method can be polymorphic. Why is method be polymorphic? Basically, def with the parameter like this, you can then again def inc, right? And then take in y and c, basically have two inputs. But function is never polymorphic, they have a type. So over here, uh, including the underscore, including the underscore, it gives a functional form. It takes an int and will return, will return an int. So we are talking about type. So let's talk a little bit more detail about type and, and, and have this uh, polymorphic versus uh, 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 will declare types like in or string. So let's assume function are polymorphic. Let's assume function are polymorphic, which is something like this, right? We treat class, uh, not function, not class. N times we treat the polymorphic type A, it takes in A, return A. And here's a function declaration, which is the same thing as we declared earlier. It's the same exact function. So this has the type of what I just write here. What does that mean? Anyone want to take a guess on what does it mean? What is the type of n times? It's actually, it actually eventually results in A. It eventually results in A. This is what this last arrow sign tell you. When you have the inputs, this would evaluate into A. But the type of my function, the type of my function is a little bit more well declared. Why is it well more, uh, more well declared? That's the left side right here, right? And that's a right side right here. This has a type of it take a function that return a, 
it takes in an integer and it takes in a. Right? That's the left side. Is this a function that takes a and then return a? This is an int and this is a. So, so our function n times actually the type of n times is a function, right? That has whatever type this is, is a is a function that takes in a, return a, and takes in int, take in a. All these combine return a. All these combine return a. So it doesn't really have a type a. Because if I call something like this, right? If I call n times uh, uh, I guess what function add to the function that we declared earlier, right? And instead of a, an int, I say hi, and then 10. This is invalid, right? Because I don't know what to do with hi. I'm expecting an integer, but I don't have an integer as my input. I have a string. So instead of just having a type A, right? Having a type A for n times, which I mean it does return A, right? Having a more well declared type over here, it tells you. This function takes three inputs. The first input is a function that takes a, return a. The second input takes an integer. The third input takes a. And eventually, this function return a. So it gives you more information about what is the function supposed to do. Any questions? Because it might be confusing the first time you see this. So if I write in what is this? It's a function, right? The type of this is a function that takes in a pair of integer and a and return it, right? So if we were to call n times as a parameter, yes, we would use. So not use that kind of notion, but you need to make sure the type match. When you use n times, you need to make sure the type match what you declare. Most of the compilation error that you see so far. So okay, does this mean that the output will return the last evaluation of the function? Uh, can you elaborate that a little bit more? Like, what, what, what do you mean by the last evaluation of a function? Oh, it returns a type. Over here, it returns a, like n times return a. But the type of n, n times is a function that takes in three inputs and return a. You can also then uh, write a function that return a function, right? Uh, so if I have instead of in a instead of this, right? I extend it like this. What is the type of this? What is the type of this thing I just brought in? It actually is a it's a function that takes in a pair of in and a. It's a function that takes in a pair of in and a, and return a function that takes in an int, give you a string. So the return type here is a function. 
It's a function that takes an integer and return a string. And that's the type, yes, as you said, in this whole thing I just brought in is the type of my function. You will know exactly that the first input has to be an integer, the second input has to be an, a type A. You will know that it needs to return a function, that that function that you return has to take an int return a string. And, and that's, uh it returns a function not a string it returns a function that takes in an integer and give you a string it tells you that hey the return the return value has to be a function with that exact declaration and this is actually a common common bug that you will run into i think many of you are running into it right now whenever you compile your code in scalar Let's say a type mismatch. Because you have a really strict type, right? So when you try to convert one type to another, Scala would yell back at you, I don't know how to deal with it. Uh, for example, in here, it takes in a pair of int and a, give you a function back. And so you need to make sure you return a function that takes an int return a string. If you have a return function that takes in an int return an int, it would yell at you. I'm expecting a function that return a string, but somehow you give me a function to return an int. Any questions? So yeah, is return a function. So in this example, A is a placeholder for a type, but these function, these function that I just put in here, it doesn't have to be polymorphic. You can change A to string or change A to int. That's also fine. Uh, you can do times until zero over here, text in int, return int, right? And you multiply number until X becomes zero over here as a function declare. All right, are you all with me so far? So uh, this means that our function can get pretty complicated, right? It, it, it can get pretty complicated because you can have, have function as an input, function as an output, and you can delay evaluation. You can evaluate at the end, you can evaluate right away. So let's consider this example. If I have this function, x multiplied by y plus 2, is it less than 10? If that's true, it's turn true, else false. You notice something. You notice something with this particular uh, line. Do you need to redo the return true else false, right? Exactly. Yes. If you look at a, the type signature, it's already a boolean. So why do you even have to have that first if, right? The first if is totally unnecessary. So you can rewrite this once, right? If x multiply by y plus 2 is less than 10, you don't even need that equal, equal true, right? You can rewrite again to just this, yield the exact same result, right? This is how you can reduce a function into something more simpler, uh, something simpler, sorry, grammar. Uh, you can reduce this to something simpler and this save some time when you need to run your code, this save your headache, that you don't have to look at the first line because there's a lot of repetition that is not really useful. All right. So let's just do something more uh, complicated. Right. So let's rewrite. Right. Can I rewrite this into this? Yeah. 
the answer is yes. N times here is the same thing. It takes in a list of int, right? It's a short form. Detail is a, actually, this is a short form of detail, so I can rewrite it. Can I do this? The answer is yes again. So let me decrypt this a little bit more. Right. Over here in times, I already over here in this bracket bracket. I will declare that n times whatever I'm dealing with is a list of int, which means that this list already has the tail, right? Tail function is declare. Underscore refer to this type. It refers to this type. So underscore dot tail is a function that corresponds to this function. That is a function, basically. It's a function called tail that deal with the type that I just put in my bracket. So it knows that this is the list of int dot tail. And do the same thing. All right, let's go through more abstraction. Let's consider this example. I want to build a lottery machine, right? That I put in one number based on the second number I put in, which is n. Okay. So this takes in a function and a number. If f of n mod 2 equals 0, you return this function. Otherwise, you return this function. So can you tell me what's the type of this? What is the type of this? What is the type of silly, silly lottery? So it's a function. So you, you can't just say it's an int because int is a integer. It's a single thing. What does silly lottery text in as an input? Yes, it's a function that takes in a function and, and an integer and it returns what? It returns another function, another function that takes in integer return an integer. So if you want to write it, it's something like this. This part is your f, right? Your f from here. This part is n, right? From here. This is the return type, which are these two things. Alternatively, if I want to describe it in human language, if we give a function that take integer into integer and one more integer, we'll get a function that gives you integer. which means we can also then bind this to a variable. For example, we can do val magic equal silly lottery. That's the function. I have x as an input, return three multiplied by x minus nine, 25. So what's magic 21? Can someone tell me what's magic 21?
All right, so someone already tried to answer. So let's go through this example, right? Assuming that you are you're trying to follow through and, and try some example. This is my function, right? So we'll go to silly lottery first and see what function does this return? This is function f, this is n, right? So what is f of n? You put 25 here, right? Multiply by three minus nine, right? So what's the value of that? It's 75 minus nine, right? So that's 66. Is 66 divisible by two? Is 66 divisible by two? Yes. So magic equal to x over two. So magic 21 is 21 over two, which is 10, right? Because it's x over two, but this x as an input to the magic function, which is these value. So that's why it's 21 over two. Any questions about why this is 21 over two? Okay, so how about I declare uh, magic to equal silly lottery. Oh, we, we should get a 10 because, uh, so that's a great question. The question is, are we getting a 10 or 10.5? This is an integer type. Integer type doesn't have anything after the dot. So we floor that, yes. So that, that's why you get a 10. So let's say I have this uh, silly lottery act and three multiply, uh, three plus X and then two. And we call magic two of 10. What, what is this? The function is this magic two equals silly lottery of this input, and we call magic two of ten. So three plus x x get replaced by two, right? So that's five. If f of n is five, are we picking? Are we picking these function function one or function two? Which one are we picking? One or two? Two, yes. So it's two multiplied by x plus one over here, right? So we magic two equal two multiplied by x plus one. So what is magic two of 10? 21, yes. So it seems like uh, any everyone catch up so far, right? You you got the reason why we reach the value twenty one, and over here we can play around with returning a function, right? So you can see that this can become really powerful depending on what you declare. You can return different function. You can different return different function. One more thing before I, yeah. Oh, can I summarize the process again? Yes, sure. Uh, so the process here is essentially, uh, you look at the function declaration, look at the type and carefully go through it. Carefully go to what's my first input variable name? What's the second input variable name? What's the third input variable name? Then go to the body of my function, replace, the name you see with the input. You replace the name you see with the input. For example, here you replace f with the input function. The first one will be three multiplied by x plus minus nine. The second will be three plus x. 
then you reduce the function into a different, basically into the result, right? Until you get the return value. The return value would give you something. It can be a value, it can be a function. If the return value is a function, then you can use that function later. Any more questions? Okay, so let's move on to one uh, quick thing about uh, dealing with I.O. Uh, so what is I.O.? What is whenever I whenever someone mentioned the word I.O. I slash O, what does it mean in computer science? Uh, computer engineering. Input output. Input output. Yes, exactly. Basically, uh, how you deal with keyboard, how do you deal with network packets, how do you deal with the uh, monitor, how you deal with the mouse, how you deal with the SSD or hard drive. So you can say import Scala uh, Scala dot source to deal with I/O. And here are some examples. You want to count a number of words in a file in a file on your machine. You would first obviously input uh, the the include the IO the source. Then uh, you can do source dot standard input. Right, source dot standard input means that you are going to look at the standard input and get this particular function and map it. All right. So we are going to continue into a concept called continuation. Uh, let's take a quick break because I think you need to context switch from one topic to another. Continuation is a little bit different. It's more tied to tail recursion that we cover. So let's do a quick break. 10 minutes, we'll meet at, at around uh, 12, 10. Is that okay? Cool. So let's meet again around 12.10. Uh, if you need more coffee, please feel free to do so. If you need to go get food, uh, and somehow you can get that in 10 minutes, feel free to do so too as well. All right.
Okay. Uh, I guess back. Let's continue on to continuation. Uh, no pun intended, but does sound like a pun. Uh, so, so far, we talk about function can return something, right? And we just told you all that we can now return a function. Which means that you can write a function that recursively return function calls. Basically, right at the end of function, you call a new function. This is this style of writing the program is called continuation passing style or CPS. Uh, if you look at the tail recursion, we discussed that tail recursion provides a lot of benefit because you would perform evaluation as you basically as you go through function calls right and toward the end you return the value you return accumulator but not every function can be done in a way that uh uh you would like to be uh in, in a tail recursion not every single function can be written in a tail recursive way continuation allows you to write every function call make it a tail call. So let's go through one first example. The first example, uh, we want to sum all the integer in my list. Basically, you want to sum all the integer in my list. Are you with me so far? Basically, this is what we want to do. You have a list, you want to sum everything. Okay, WebEx told me that I have a lot of background noise. Is that the case? Uh, can you still hear me clearly or is it or is it? It is clear as well. Okay, perfect. Uh, awesome, sorry. Basically, our task is we want to sum all the integer in my list. Input is our list. Simple, right? Input is our list. And this function is this is the normal version so this is normal version right what it does is you start from zero if the list is empty we return zero if it's not empty we just add x into some recurs the recursive call sum of the rest of the list if we want to do a tail call version it's a tail call version Basically, you would then create this helper function, right? This is your accumulator. This is the same as this. And you start from zero. You start from the base case. You don't accumulate anything yet. Go through all the elements. Then you you are basically recursively call and accumulate your result at a time. Any questions about this version? This is a tail recursion. Then let's do a continuation version, which might look confusing or intimidating in the beginning, but we'll break this down. Right? I'm going to show you the code. I'm going to break it down for you. Here's the code. This part is the same. This part is the same. You have a list of integer and you want to sum them together. Return type is the same. The result of summation is an integer. You also then do pattern matching. That's the same. You have our, our list as an input. You match if it's empty or if there's anything in my list. If there's anything in my list or if this is empty. The difference here is you have a function as an accumulator. What does a function do? Take an integer, take an int, return and int. Over here, what's the main task? We want to sum multiple number together. Right? We want to sum multiple number together. So our function 
in many in most cases the body of the function this accumulate the result okay basically you are going to return a function that takes in r plus x r plus x what is r and what is x r is the input to my function r is the input to my function is a parameter yes we declare it right here declare r initially initially we pass in a function that takes in x and return x it's the function that takes in the number and return the same number l is our list right so this is actually go into as k as we declare it right here it's the function that takes in integer return an integer so the first time you call this you get the full list. L is the complete list. K, text in X, return X. If my list is empty, if my list is empty, what do I return? If my list is empty, I'm gonna, I want to return zero, right? So how can K return zero? You call K zero. This would give you zero, right? Because I my input is x is x, return function is x. Otherwise, if my list is not empty, you fall into the second category. The second category right here. So what do you return? You return a call to some helper, right? Yes. And then this is remainder of my list is a tail it's a it's a tail of my list basically it gave this map to x colon xs xs are the tail of my list instead of calling this function you basically change your function you change your function while you're going to recursively through this function now my new function takes in r right, as an input you then return k of r plus x so for the first time what is k k is you give x you get x right so what is k of r plus x? k of r plus x is going to equal r plus x. Okay. It's going to equal r plus x. Yep. Uh, yeah, so your answer in the private chat is correct. It's r plus x. So the next time some helper called us, you uh, sending the tail list the second argument is a function that takes in r give you r plus x the second time you call this k becomes r plus x some helper would then return the rest of my tail plus r plus the other r plus x these behave like an accumulator then toward the end toward the end when the list is empty when the list is empty you return k of zero what is k of zero is that function you add zero to it because you're done you get the sum any questions so far So x colon xs is not xs dot tail. x colon xs break your list down into x, which is an integer, and xs, which is a list 
that is similar to fs uh, uh, this list dot tail so that's a great question so how is k working as an accumulator basically the way k works is initially you return itself the next time you call this, you're going to return the first item in my list plus itself. The second time you call this, you're going to return the first item in your list plus the second item in your list plus the uh, itself, right? Whatever, whatever is going in as an input. The third time you call this, this is going to down recursively then you're going to have the first item plus the second item and plus the third item plus itself. When you're done, let's say there are four items. You can have one plus two plus three plus four. And when you're at the base case, you have k of zero. k of zero is exactly zero. So you're going to have one plus two plus three plus four plus zero return. And yes, for the other question, x colon colon xs is split the list into the first and the rest. Yes. All right, so we are going to go to another example, which gets a little bit more complicated. Um, binary tree. Fundamentally, binary tree can be defined recursively, right? So when you look at the node of the tree, it's empty or another node with left and right subtree. So let's first make a tree. Basically, let's build an object for binary tree. Uh, we can say seal tree tree. Uh, this built a tree that has an object called empty. Empty is an empty node. Or if it's not empty, it can take the class node. The class node has the left and the right subtree and the key, which is the integer, the extend tree. So making a tree can be done by calling this. If I do this, what does my tree look like? Let's do one and a half, right? You start with don't know two. For five, is that the parent of two or is that the child of two? Oh, can you? Yes, I can go back here. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so for here, uh, what does this mean? Five is a parent of two, right? It's the right parent of two. How about the shell of five? The shell of five is seven, yes. And then the children is six and nine. Everyone got this? Okay, uh, so so the way you start is, or well, you can go left to right. This is how I first do it. Go left to right. The first thing I see is here, right? I have a node. The node consists of the left side and the right side. The left side has another node that consists of two. So I put two right here. And I know that, okay, in the middle, there's a value five, so I put it here. And to the right, to the right, there's another node. What does the, that node consist of? It's a node that consists of left subtree, right subtree. The left subtree is six. The middle, you have seven. The right subtree is nine. Is it possible to define it line by line? Uh, in functional programming, you kind of define it all together, but 
you can do this recursively. You start with five, and then you add two, and then you add seven, and you add six, and you add nine. And yes, I agree, it doesn't look nice doing it like this. Uh, some people would like to divide everything in one line. I kind of hate it. You can put in a new line. You can put in a new line, but it has to be the same, a part of the same argument. Scala would treat new line as just a space bar. Uh, so it's, it's, this is common in functional programming. Yeah. Okay, so how do we do traversal? So let's, this is actually how do we do tree traversal, right? So you go through the tree, and so you have input as a tree, and you want to return a list of integer, right? You go through all the nodes and list them out one by one by one. And what is an in order traversal? What is an in order traversal? If I have a binary search tree, what do I get? If I perform an in order traversal, you get an ordered list. Yes, basically you're gonna get sorted list. You go left first, you go to the left subtree, basically from this example, right from this example, I'm gonna use a red color to show the, the, the order of how I visit the node. I go in here, then I go here, I print two here, then I go here, I'm gonna get five. I go here to the right. I don't print it yet, I go to the left first, and I'm gonna print six, go back, seven, go here, nine. You go to the left first, until the end, get that value, go back up, get the middle value, go back down to the right, get that right value. If there's a left subtree, go to the left, keep going to the left, then go back up again, then go to the right. So that's an in order traversal. To do this with the normal recursion, uh, I'll explain what the triple colon mean. Basically, this is simple. You walk in order to the left. You have the middle component right here, and you have the right component right here. And you notice this is a pen, right? K to your list. Triple colon means I'm going to append two lists together. List. List. So this is kind of like a sheet operator. Instead of two colons, I put three colons. Three colons put in first list, second list, attach them. So what if you want to use continuation? What if you want to use continuation? What should the function do? Okay, so we are going to... So the question is, can you append a non-empty non, non list with an empty list with triple colon? Yes, I believe so. I'm 99.9% sure you can do that. Basically, the triple columns means that the one in front doesn't have to be one single thing anymore. It can be a list. As long as it's the same type, you're OK. All right. So. Here is the code to do in order traversal. I'm going to break it down for sure, right? Because this seems complex. It is a little bit complex. <laughs> Same thing here. You have a tree. You return a list. And at some point, you call your helper function. Okay, you call your helper function. What does your helper function do? What does your helper function do? Initially, the way you call this helper function, you have a list, you return the same list. This is the same thing as the sum, right? Where you have x as an input and you return x. If your tree is empty, you return k of nil, which is an empty list. An empty list. 
if this is not empty, I'm going to use a different color so that it shows the difference. You start by recursively call this function. Oops. Recursively call the function right here. Right. What does my call do? Okay. What does cont walk take as an input? They take two inputs, right? What's the first input? The tree. What's the second input? Some long convoluted function, actually. It's a function. It's a function that take in a list, return a list. It's a function that reads, the first input takes a tree, the second input takes a function. What does this function do? It process one list, spit out another list. Right? So the first can't walk, the tree, basically, the in order traversal, you break it down to the left subtree and the right subtree, right? Left subtree and right subtree. And you stick K in the middle. The middle thing goes in the middle. So, so, over here, I throw in the left subtree. I throw in the left subtree. And then I want to build my left side of my list. I want to build my left side of the list. How do I build it? How do I build it? This is a function. It's a function that takes in the left list. Hopefully with the left subtree, I would get I would get the left list. And this left list call the same function again, but now on the right subtree, on the right subtree to build the right, right list, to build the right list. And my recursion, this function k, which correspond to, um, let me use a different color here. This function k right here, right? What it does is I'm going to append the left and the right list with k in the middle, with k in the middle. Basically my function k, my function k is the one that built the list, right? If I draw in a tree, K will build an entire tree. If I draw in L, which is the left subtree, K, the function K will build your list for the left subtree. If I draw in the right subtree, hopefully K would build the right subtree. Then you get the left list, the right list, append them together. That's how you can do it. In order traversal using uh, using continuation. Basically, this function called k would build your list. You build your list when you go through this in uh, recursively. You go to until it's empty. Right when it's empty, you return a list of nothing. Go up one step. Go up one step. You append k to the right list. If the right list is empty, basically this is, is a list that has one item. Yes, so I think I need an example. I would do that. And yes, too. This also handles the case where the node has only either the left or the right child. So I'm going to use the earlier example here, right? The three here, two, five, seven, six, nine. So this is our tree, two, five, seven, six, nine. So this is our example. I'm gonna show it how this works. I'm gonna use a different color uh, here with a blue color to show the steps, right? We first go in here and we first go in here, we have a tree. Our tree is two, five, seven, six, nine. The first thing it does is can't walk left and right. So it split into the left side and the right side. So we'll go to the right side first because the right side is in the innermost parenthesis. So we are going to this first, the right side right here. It's a tree again, right? It's a tree again. So we can do KS node of LKR, LKR left 
and right. And because the right side is the innermost parenthesis, I'm going to go to the right first, which is the node 9 here, right? node 9. We are at the end. This is empty. This is empty to where it goes shall of node 9. So you go into this first function, right? Case empty, return k of nil. This is an, so we return back right here. This becomes nil. This becomes nil. Your k is now nine because it, we are at node nine, right? k is nine. This small k is nine. The function k, this whole thing, this whole thing is basically empty colon, 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 nine, colon, colon, empty, which is basically a list that has nine in them. All right, so we are done with this part. Are you still with me? We have the list that has nine at the end. All right, so I'm gonna erase this so that I can continue on to the next step. So the next step, we go up, right? So it's the node that has seven and six. So the node that has seven and six, let's go to the left now, right? Because we just finished with the right and the right list is essentially nine. Now we go to the left list. The left list, we go down is six, right? Similar to nine, basically. Left side empty, right side empty. I'm gonna return just K. So that is going to be a list of what? This is the left side. Is the left up. list and left left sub tree the same thing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, left list is the list that represents the left sub tree. So you have six here, and k is what value? Seven. Yep. Right. So when we combine all this together, what do we get? We get six, seven, and nine. Right. So we are done with this part. What we are left with is two and five, right? So let's go back one more step. Yay. All right, then if you go back one more step at node five right here, we just say the right list is six, seven, nine, right? So we go to the left. We go to the left and the left list, similar to how we process node six and node nine, it's two, right? So this is two. What is K? Five, yep. So when we perform this operation, you got, you, you will get two, five, six, seven, and nine. And return. All right, so are you with me so far with this example? Basically, we go down. Whenever we hit the end, you return that one item, right? Because we are basically appending empty, that item empty. If the left is not empty and the right side is empty, then you just have the left side, that item, and empty. Okay, any questions? Okay, cool. So this is probably the most confusing part about this current lecture uh, on, on continuation. Uh, the, this concept for currying, uh, we'll talk about it next week, I think. Let's switch over to the exercise because we have one more in class exercise for you. Uh, here in class exercise eight, which is basically with the continuation passing stuff, implement Fibonacci and perform three order traversal, which means instead of going left, right, and uh, left, middle, right, you go root, 
left, right. So basically, check out the 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 code that we have in the lecture, and see how you would convert this to a pre-order traversal. All right. So that's the end of the lecture right now. I'll give you about 20 minutes to go get food. Uh, make sure you can come back and join Discord. If you are still stuck with trying to get Scala running, this is a great time to uh, check and, and see how you can get it running. And if you have questions about the homework, it's also a great time to have a conversation about like, okay, I am stuck here. What do we do? Uh, okay, there was a, there's a question about uh, giving a tree as an input to be give it in as a list. Uh, you mean the exercise or do you mean the example earlier? The exercise. Oh, uh, same same input type. You give a tree as an input, then then we got the we we expect the list as an output. 